if the officer says, order your fire lock. Order your fire lock, okay. You'll have your fire on this side. I recover, which one's cover? <laughs> recover your fire locks. Prime and load. Break ready. Present. Fire. I don't feel like a soldier. I think I'm a pretty long way from being a proper 18th century infantryman. The British had done everything they could to prepare their men for fighting on the open field of battle. But what they hadn't counted on was that they now had to fight a very different kind of enemy. For thousands of years before any Europeans arrived, these lands had been inhabited by Native American tribes. Many of them had managed to reach a peaceful coexistence with the French, but they feared that the British would force them off the land. And so they allied themselves with the French and launched an effective guerrilla campaign against the invaders. The British at this camp in particular felt isolated. They felt surrounded by an unseen enemy. Uh, all too often they'd leave sentries out at night and in the morning they'd discover their horribly mutilated corpses. Around about this time of day, at sunset, uh, everyone in the camp had to stand to arms to be ready to repel an attack. The problem for the British was that they were fighting in a landscape that was totally alien to them against an enemy for whom this was home. André Bourbou knows more than most about this environment and what it takes to survive in it. So André, didn't you spend a month in the wilderness with some credit cards and a car key? Yeah, it was a, one of those crazy things to do when you're young, you know, an adventure. <laughs> But yeah, 31 days with uh, no gear, no food, no, no fire, no matches, no, no knife, uh, nothing at all. Just, just the clothes on my back. And did that give you an insight into just how, uh, how difficult it is to survive in these conditions? It gave me a great big deal of, uh, of respect for our, our forefathers. It's just uh, unbelievable how tough you have to be to do these, these, these things. So in the, in, the, uh, in the fighting 250 years ago, uh, what advantages did the Native Americans have over these British coming in? Well, they just had thousands of years of experience, you know. Um, I've been researching wilderness survival the last 30 years, and I, uh, I swear I'm a, a rank beginner compared to these guys that did it day in and day out, every single day. They were tough, they knew everything. So when the French Canadians came in, they, they kind of learned from the Indians how to do it. They'd learn how to make the fires, how to, what kind of shelters, what kind of materials you use to build your shelters and all this from the native people. It's interesting because these redcoats, these British soldiers have arrived here in North America. They spent their whole careers training for a different kind of warfare. Yeah. You know, standing in lines on big open fields mm -hmm. shooting muskets. And here they are. I mean, I guess they have to learn a, well, a, a completely new way of fighting. Yeah, they, they can't win against, against somebody that knows the force because uh, Ed knows the force, he's, he's gonna, they're going to be completely camouflaged. You can't see a guy in the forest if he's camouflaged. How I mean, about if he's wearing a bright red coat? Well, <laughs> you know, they stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Techniques like camouflage, ambush, and even building traps gave the Native Americans and their French allies a huge advantage over the British. That's a lot of kick. <laughs> so I guess the thing that people have always read about this, this war and this, these conditions is tracking, how the Native Americans are amazing trackers. Are you, are you an expert at that? Oh, not, not a great expert, but uh, I can follow you, that's for sure. I'm actually very, very light-footed, I've got to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Even from this far away, you can see that hole where you stepped on. Okay, wait, wait, let me come back and you can show me. Okay, so you, you kind of stepped in here and, and ripped that moss off of this one. Okay. And then as you walk in here, 
you know, you kind of stumbled on this one and, yeah. and kicked right into it and made a big hole. Yeah. That is pretty obvious, I have to say. Th that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Okay, Andre, I take your point. So are there ways to minimize your tracks? Well, the, the first thing you're going to do is wear moccasins. You know, look, look how f flat they are and there's, there's no, no grips. And then as, as you walk, you just, you just watch every single step. See how your, your foot kind of breaks that? With moccasins, your, your ankles bend. And with boots, your ankles don't bend. So then everything gets cut. I suppose eventually, if you, if you do this enough, it becomes second nature. You could virtually run through this forest w without leaving all these signs. Oh, Indian, Indian folk would be able to do that. The British were trapped. French cannon protected the narrows. Thousands of French troops were defending the shore and in the wilderness the British were at the mercy of the Native Americans. So they took revenge on the Canadian inhabitants of the countryside. For miles around, the British burnt farms and destroyed houses. This is the remains of a church which the British attacked killing those who'd been sheltering inside. Just one of many atrocities committed that summer. There was particular animosity to this campaign. Wolf himself wrote the year before that it would be a pleasure to see the Canadian vermin sacked and pillaged and justly repaid of this unheard of cruelty. But the interesting thing about the British Army is they didn't all agree with that. One of Wolf's brigadiers, the rank below him, a man called Townsend, uh, said, I never served in so disagreeable a campaign as this. It's a scene of skirmishing, cruelty and devastation. It is war of the worst shape, a scene I ought not to be in. The inhabitants of Quebec weren't safe either. The British had taken Point Levy on the other side of the Narrows. Today, just a short ferry ride away from Quebec. And from here, they used another weapon shipped all the way from Britain, artillery. At 9 p.m. as the light was falling on the 12th of July, 1759, a firework blasted up from here, and that was the sign for the artillery bombardment to begin. At each of the cannon, a blue-coated artillery sergeant marched up, lit the gunpowder, and cannonballs were sent flying towards the town. Now, initially, because the barrels were cold, the British cannonballs were falling short. They weren't reaching the town. They were dropping into the St. Lawrence. And the British soldiers up here could hear the shouts and jeers of the French defenders. But the British cranked up the elevation to the maximum, about 45 degrees. And as the barrels heated up, the cannonballs started to hit home. Not just cannonballs, but explosive mortar rounds, and even things called carcasses, which were big, flaming incendiary bombs, which left the trail like a comet as they arched through the sky. The governor of Quebec estimated that 200 of those incendiary bombs hit Quebec on that first night. For weeks to come, the British bombarded Quebec mercilessly. As this British map shows, their artillery was able to reach right into the city. No part of the town was completely safe. This square, the Place Royale, the lower town, was particularly badly hit. There's a contemporary drawing here which shows the damage. It's absolutely extraordinary. There's not a single house that isn't totally destroyed here. The church in the middle burnt out. There was hardly a building left standing in Quebec. If they hadn't been destroyed by cannonballs, they'd been consumed by fire started by the carcasses. But the people of Quebec were still determined to resist. This enormous use of force against the civilian population of Quebec, so reminiscent of the uh, strategic bombing campaigns of the 20th century, wasn't bringing Wolf any closer to capturing this town. It was just causing utter misery for the inhabitants.
The main British force was still stuck on the far side of the Montmorency River, looking across at its enemy. With winter approaching, Wolfe couldn't risk waiting any longer. He decided to launch an attack aimed at the French defences on the other side of the waterfall. The British were attempting a new kind of amphibious attack. Flat-bottomed boats, being used in combat for the first time, would land the men onto this shore. Then the troops would storm across this narrow strip of land, attacking the French at the base of the cliff. But they would be running the risk of facing heavy fire from the French troops at the top of the cliff. Wolfe's plan was to send his men ashore here. Now, the trouble was, they got the tides badly wrong. As you can see, see, I've never been down here before, but you see all these sandbanks emerge from the St Lawrence. You realise just how shallow it is. As the boats came in, they hit these sandbanks, and the men had to jump out and try and haul them over and work out a sort of passage through to the shore here, and that took hours. The big problem with that, of course, also, is that the French got the perfect idea about where the British were planning to attack. So they spent the whole afternoon rushing reinforcements into their entrenchments and their redoubts up there. General Wolfe, worth mentioning, was in the thick of the action. He was hit by three splinters as French cannonballs crashed into the ship. He even had his cane knocked out of his hand, apparently. To finally negotiating these obstacles and getting their boats quite near the shore, the British soldiers jumped out onto this beach, and one British sergeant has left this account. He says that the beach was covered with slimy mud, exceeding slippery and broken into deep holes. And well, that's recognisably this beach. But once Wolfe's men had got to shore, something absolutely remarkable happened. Rather than listening to their officers and falling into neat ranks, ready for the next phase of the assault, the band played the Grenadiers' March, and with that, the men took off in a wild, mad charge. Although extremely brave, this attack was foolhardy. Wolf couldn't believe his eyes. He later called it unsoldierlike, irregular and impetuous, but you couldn't fault them for trying. And the French couldn't believe their luck. They were just sitting in their trenches, firing their muskets down onto these grenadiers. They poured their small shot like showers of hail, which caused our brave grenadiers to fall very fast. And from here on the beach, for a couple of hundred metres, the ground was soon thick with casualties. Suddenly, the rain poured from the heavens. One officer wrote, the violence of the storm exceeded any description I can give of it. All of the men's powder was absolutely soaked. The British grenadiers tramped back down to this beach. They looked behind them, they saw this field of dead and wounded grenadiers was now the target of whooping bands of Native Americans and Canadians who left the trenches up on the hill and ran down to mutilate and kill those they'd left behind. One sergeant said that the men were filled with horror at the barbarous cruelty of the savages committed on their brother soldiers. Poor planning and a breakdown of discipline had brought humiliating defeat, and worse was to come. After defeat at the battle on the other side of the Montmorency Falls came disease. Typhus and dysentery tore through the British army, and eventually Wolfe himself also fell sick. Now, he received a lot better treatment than most of his men. He was able to commandeer this house, still survives amazingly, surrounded by modern suburbia, where he was able to recuperate up there in the attic. But for several days, it looked like he might not make it, and his army were gravely concerned. Then he writes an extraordinary letter to his mother, and he says he has nothing to report but defeats and disappointments. And he finishes with an extraordinary admission. He says, I have launched a plan of quitting the service, which I am determined to do at the first opportunity. Wolfe was convinced that the failure to defeat the French was his responsibility and his officers agreed. One wrote, General Wolfe's health is very bad. His generalship is, in my opinion, not a bit better. They were frustrated with Wolfe's obsession with attacking the well-defended Beauport shore. They thought they had a better idea. They wanted to attack Quebec from the other side. 
here on the Plains of Abraham at the top of the steep cliffs. But landing troops here would mean getting their ships past the French defences. No easy task. In order for the British ships to get past the narrows here and past the gun batteries in Quebec, they had to wait for the sun to go down and the tide had to be perfect, it had to be steaming in at full speed and the wind had to be from blowing over my shoulder. Everything had to be exactly right. That meant the ships could get up some speed and shoot the narrows before the French had time really to unleash their cannon batteries in full force on them. Thanks to the skill and bravery of the British sailors, the Navy succeeded in getting a large number of ships through the Narrows with only minor damage from the French guns. Wolfe finally recovered and took command. By now, winter was fast approaching, so he reluctantly went along with his officer's plan. He ordered his troops to get ready for one last attack. Once again, it would be an amphibious assault. It would need the perfect integration of the army and navy, and this time, they would attempt to land in a secret night attack. Their landing point was by a ravine, where a rough track led up the cliffs, called the Anse aux Foulons. In the early hours of September the 13th, 1759, Wolfe's first wave landed here, quite near the Anse aux Foulons. Conditions were as they are tonight, still and clear. The perfect conditions for amphibious landing. The landing spot today is a working port, a reminder that history can be found in industrial parks, not just national parks. Well, this is certainly one obstruction that the British troops didn't have to put up with. The Anso Foulon is just over there. They've built a modern road up the ravine where the old track used to be. But we're told that the first wave of Wolf's army actually landed a little bit further downstream, somewhere around about here. And they were forced to climb up a section of cliff without any track up it at all. So these British troops knew they had to get to the top to clear away the French defenders so the rest of the British force could land. Everything depended on these guys getting up this slope as quickly as possible. It's actually brilliant, this, because it tallies with the uh, accounts written on the, on the day itself, which says they used to, they were grabbing onto roots and bushes and they went up, and actually there's nothing else here at all to hold on to. Uh, this soil is particularly difficult to get a grip on. It just comes away under your feet. You can see why this climb became one of the legends of British military history. Schoolboys into the 20th century were taught about this and they came to symbolise everything that the British liked to think of themselves as. It was sort of brave soldiers overcoming the odds against nature, against their enemy, toughing it out to achieve final victory. Mm. Mm. They arrived here at the top and found themselves near the top of the track which led up from the Elster Foulon, where this modern road now runs. Fortunately, they'd ended up just behind a French camp that was guarding the track. The soldiers there were taken completely by surprise. The French now had no stomach for that fight, and they fled. The road from Elster Foulon to the Heights of Abraham now lay open. Well, I've just climbed the cliffs up here to the rolling plains of Abraham. It's about 6 a.m. on a September morning, and the sun is just peeking up above the uh, fortress of Quebec there, and really around about the same time that Wolf would have made that climb. And it's incredible being up here now. They, they, there's a golden glow on all the trees. It's really quite magical. By sunrise, over 4,000 British troops had made it up the steep track and onto the plains, 
hauling two cannon with them. From the accounts, it seems that the soldiers were invigorated by this climb and this sharp fight that had occurred at the top. But now there was a time for contemplation. The landings had been successful, but there was also a sense of foreboding because they knew that what came next had to be a battle. French sentries could now see the British and delivered the shocking news to their commander, Montcalm. He knew that if the British could dig in on the plains and lay siege, the walls of Quebec would soon fall. So he made the decision to go out and fight. And what's true of all amphibious landings, you think particularly about D-Day, for example, is that they're most vulnerable in the minutes and hours after they first occur. That's the best chance that defenders have of rushing onto the beach and throwing the attackers back into the water. The British now readied themselves. This was what they'd been waiting for, a chance to put all their training into action on the open field of battle. But as they reached this point here, approximately about half a mile away from the walls of Quebec, they saw the French army streaming out of the gates. One British soldier said they were like bees coming out of a hive. This is approximately where the British line would have been, starting down there next to the cliffs by the river and then stretching in a long line this way for about half a mile, about three feet between each of the soldiers. And usually the British army had lined up three deep, but some young officers like Wolfe insisted that two ranks would be enough. So really this period sees the birth of what we now call the thin red line. In the front rank were the tallest men. One, one drill manual says, the most well-made men to intimidate the enemy as they charge towards them. They were told to stand bolt upright, chests out, eyes forward, and in dead silence, waiting for the commands of their officers and waiting for the enemy. Meanwhile, the French had formed up a rough and ready line over there, but whereas the British stood still waiting, the French couldn't wait and they charged. <laughs> It wasn't an orderly advance. There was some confusion. There was shouting and running. There were calls of vive la roi, which is long live the king. And they sort of hurtled towards the British line. Now, the British unleashed their first deadly weapon. The British cannon switched to firing what they call canister, which are boxes with 400 musket balls in that explode when they come out of the cannon and turn them into some giant shotguns. And these cut down swathes of French. The French firing was pretty wild anyway because they were running along and firing as they went. So most of their shots were missing. As the French charged towards them, the British stood still and ready. This was the moment that these British troops lined up in their ranks had been training for, not just for the summer, but for their entire careers. Hour upon hour of musket drills. When the French were 50 or 60 meters out, the command came to present and a thousand muskets were raised and pointed at the enemy. They aimed typically for the French ankles, knowing that the muskets tended to fire high. Then, when the French were 40 meters away, when the officers could see the whites of their eyes, came the command, fire. The effect of that musket volley was shattering. Many of the British muskets were loaded with two balls, and as a result, thousands of musket balls traveling at 500 feet per second crashed into the French ranks. Ah! French charge came to a halt. Many of their officers and their leaders were wiped out. Then, just 20 seconds later, the British had reloaded and fired another volley, and then again and again. For five or six minutes, the French stood in utter confusion, their sight completely obscured by huge clouds of musket smoke, the noise of the volleys deafening them, the smell of all the gunpowder was apparently nauseous. The French officers that remained said they'd never experienced anything like it. The British strategy was all about the musket and how to use it to maximum effectiveness. To see a musket in action, 
I've come to meet battlefield archaeologist Tony Pollard. We've got a, a, a row of soldiers at about 70 yards up at the top of the hill. That represents the distance, roughly, that the French opened fire at. So it's, it's quite a long range, as you can see. And uh, first off, we'll have a crack at those okay, on the top of the hill. Okay, go for it. Well, I saw a lot of... Mud. I think I hit those rocks at the back. I think you might, might have done them. Well, well, let's try another let's one, try see, another. If you, uh, see if you get any luckier. Okay. At 70 yards, Tony was having real oh. difficulty hitting the targets. That was low. Just to the left, wasn't it, I think, that one? The British, however, right. waited until the French were much closer, as little as 30 yards. It's amazing, no matter how many times you read about it or write about it, actually seeing it here in this field, 30 yards is so close. And you're talking about thousands of men coming at you as a solid mass. It would have taken nerves of steel, really. Whoa! Now, this is where it gets a little different. Ah! They were double-shotting, they were using two musket yep. balls for every gun. As you can see, that's, that's lead, and when that hits something hard, it just spreads out dreadfully. It's a horrible weapon. OK, now, I suggest you step well back yeah. this baby. Oh. oh! Well, you can see a lot of splintering around here. Yeah, this has caused some real damage. Oh! So I think that's a pair there. Gosh, so they do, they do spread a fair bit, yeah. don't they? This chap, he's gone right through, through there. And the thing is that at this range, they probably would have passed straight the way through the human body unless it hit something hard like yeah. the musket or maybe bone. But it's, it's highly likely the musket ball would have travelled, we've, we've replicated that in the past, would have travelled directly through the body and may, may even impact it on the guy behind him. Wow. It's horrific, Just really, isn't it? Devastating physically and psychologically. Yeah. Sure enough, the French couldn't withstand the British musket fire. They turned and fled, leaving behind them hundreds of dead and wounded comrades. Britain had its victory. Months of preparation, a journey of a thousand miles, and a summer of stalemate had climaxed in a battle lasting less than half an hour. It had been Wolfe's victory, but he didn't live long enough to enjoy the spoils. As always, he'd been in the thick of the fighting. He'd been wounded more than once. The final time came when a musket ball crashed into his chest. He was helped back from the front line to this very spot where he collapsed. He lived just long enough to hear that the French were fleeing. Then he said, now God be praised, I can die in peace. Wolf was now a national hero, and a painting of his death would immortalize him, becoming the single most reproduced image of the 18th century. And this is it, the death of General Wolfe by the young American artist Benjamin West. It's self-consciously epic, Wolfe lies in the middle, mortally wounded like the hero in some classical myth. The Union flag here draped over his shoulders whilst the great and good from his army look around in dismay and at this Native American like a noble savage looks on at his beloved commander. Now, all of this, of course, is totally untrue. None of the great and good of his army were standing around like this, and, of course, there were no Native Americans present. He absolutely hated them. But, of course, what West is doing here is not about an accurate depiction of his death. It's about creating a myth. Wolf is portrayed as Britain's first imperial martyr, dying so that the new British Empire may live. But Wolfe wasn't the only commander to suffer a fatal injury that day. Montcalm was shot as he fled and died the next morning. He is now buried in this graveyard. With the French general dead, Quebec surrendered. After a bloody summer for the British, only 50 of their men had been killed in the decisive battle. But for the survivors, the greatest challenge was yet to come. Winter proved to be a deadlier foe even than the French. The temperatures plummeted to minus 30. The countryside froze, as did the River St Lawrence. There was no chance of getting fresh supplies into the beleaguered British garrison of Quebec. The town itself was shattered. The buildings provided no protection from the elements at all. The British died in their hundreds of scurvy and exposure. The ground was too hard to dig graves, and so British corpses were piled up, frozen like logs outside the city walls. That 
at least their sacrifice was not in vain. Quebec was now part of the British Empire, though it was allowed to keep its French language and culture. This victory helped turn the tide of the Seven Years' War in Britain's favor. In 1763, France finally admitted defeat, and it ceded the whole of Canada and the American Midwest to Britain. It was the end of New France. Victory at Quebec showed how Britain's industrial might, its powerful navy, and a rigorous scientific approach to warfare could make it unbeatable. Britain was now the world's dominant superpower and had taken control over what would become the richest continent on Earth. But the British didn't have long to enjoy the fruits of their victory. They'd finished the war victorious, but terribly in debt. Now, the British government's plan was to raise a bit of money by taxing the American colonists. But the Americans realized that now the threat of the French had gone, they didn't need British protection at all. And less than a generation after Quebec, America rose up in rebellion against the British crown. And who's the man that the Americans turned to to lead them in this struggle? Well, the man that has started the Seven Years' War, George Washington. As the Washington Monument celebrates, he inflicted a humiliating defeat on the British and created the United States of America as a nation free of Britain's empire. But thanks in large part to Wolfe's victory, North America is primarily English, not French speaking. And to this day, the USA's law, culture and constitution are built firmly on British foundations. The capture of Quebec was one of the British Empire's greatest ever victories and shaped North America as we know it today. But it also led directly to Britain's most catastrophic defeat. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe. <laughs>